let's already introduce our guest who's here with us inside of the studio. And I'm talking about none other than Kene uh, Osuji, who's a legal practitioner. We've had you on the show many times before, and we've kind of like had these kinds of conversations that have to do with people's rights. Only this time is different because we're talking about children. Yes. And the question that one has to ask is, what is the Nigerian judiciary's um, uh, uh, format or apparatus to handling such cases where children are involved? Do they get tried just as adults, or are there any recommendations or considerations that should be given to them because of their age? Thank you for having me here again. Thank you for um, being here. Yes, yeah, so the Nigerian legal system is very vast, and when it comes to children, there's a particular law known as the Child Rights Act, and the Child Rights Act stipulates extensively the mode of um, how it basically sets the rights of children and the events children maybe uh, commit offenses. It states extensively the procedure in which their arrest and you know trial should follow. Mm. And and um, looking at the act extensively and looking at what has happened in court, we we can say that some of the provisions of the Child Rights Act we are not followed. Mm. Mm. So this um, charges, it's, um, it's wild to even start with. It's unfathomable. We're talking treasonable felony, uh, terrorism. So I have to ask you, legally speaking, can minors be charged with this uh, type of crime, especially given that some of these children are under the age of majority? Yes. So on the legal standpoint, a child above the age of seven can't be tried or can't be charged to court for a criminal offense. A child, a child below seven is not criminally liable for any offense. A child below the age of 13 um, is said to be liable in the events. A child below the age of 12 or 13 cannot be liable except there is um, uh, an action that shows that he had the intention. Mm. A child can't be tried for a criminal offense even though he's below the age of 18, but there are certain parameters that must be followed, and these parameters are listed very extensively in the Child Rights Act. Going to the question of treason, mm. a criminal charge, any lawyer, any police officer would know that there must be two elements, mm -hmm. the act and the intention. Mm -hmm. This must go together, except in strict liability offenses like um, maybe that basically states when you commit an act, you're guilty by the commission of the act alone. So we have to look at the intention. The fact that an act was committed, did it come along with the intention? Exactly. And we're looking at treason. What is treason? Treason is an act, you know, to overthrow a government. Mm. And the police officers mentioned carrying some flags, you know. Yeah. But the, these children, because the matter is sub -judice. I'm not speaking to the substance of the case. Mm. Right. So. If a child carries a flag during a protest, does he have the intention mm. to overthrow the Nigerian government? Is he, is he capable of designing that concept of a intention? Scheme to, that of scheme. That scale. Is he, it, thank you. The word is, is he capable of scheming that far? Yes. So these are the two elements that the prosecution or the police must marry. And when you're investigating a case, you know, you must look at the act, you must look at the intention, marry them together for there to be a successful charge. So the question that will be asked, I believe, by the uh, defense counsel will be whether these children of 13 years, 14 years, had the intention to overthrow the Nigerian government. Mm. Uh, and you, you're talking about the, 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 Ch the Child Act, uh, mm -hmm. uh, 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 Child Rights Act. Child Rights Act, but I'm just being informed that our psychologist yes. is going to be joining us uh, via video now. She is uh, Motolani Akintayo. She's a clinical psychologist and managing director, senior clinical uh, psychologist, Diamond Moore uh, Psychological Consult. And she joins us live uh, via video. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Motolani. We appreciate you for doing this with us this morning. Welcome, thank Motolani. you for having me. Thank You're you welcome. for being here. Now, we're going to get to you very quickly, but I, I did have a question for uh, Kenesa. So I'll just quickly come back into the studio and ask Kenesa. You're talking about the, the Child Rights Act, right? Yeah. In that act, the, how exactly was it so violated in the entire process? Walk me through this. The, the children were held for 93 days and counting, right? And they had just been given bail of astronomical charges that I have 
I mean, unfathomable. Where did they go wrong, and how could they have done this better? So, the Child Drug Tax stipulates very clearly that every child of a child must be in compliance with what the Act says. One, upon arrest of a child, the parents, guardians must be informed immediately of the arrest of the child. Mm. That's what. Question is, was this done? Secondly, a child should not be detained, generally speaking, at police stations, except it is mandatory to do so. And in the event that there must be a detention, it must be for the shortest period of time. So when a child is arrested, the Act requires that they be released to some um, centers, educational centers, or accommodations provided by the government. But in the event that they have to be detained, the Act stipulates very clearly it must be for the shortest period of time. And we are aware that the Nigerian Police Force secured a remand order in August mm -hmm. to detain these children, you know, for three months. The Nigerian police now, yes? Yes. You know, so that in itself is wrong. And then the, the Child Rights Act also stipulates clearly that for the trial of children, they must be tried in a family court. Mm -hmm. They shouldn't be tried alongside adults. Do we have adults. those in Nigeria, family courts? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes, How we do. functional are they and why, why has this case not been referred? I'm sorry, I'm it's elongating treason, this it's, it's treasonable because it's felony, under the treason. Uh, uh, I'm going to cut you short there. <laughs> let's talk to our psychologist who's mm. joined us via video. Motolani, let's come to you. Thank you very much for joining us once again. Now, we've been talking about this all morning. In fact, our prologue was about this same instance. And the question here is, first off, what the impact is on the kids that they've been detained for so long and now they're being brought into a, uh, perhaps, I don't know what to call it. This is, this is like a, an amphitheater that they're not even used to. I'm, I, I, I question whether they're even educated to the level of knowing what's happening to them. But what are the psychological impacts that could result in what we see or what we saw there in court, them collapsing or, you know, other antiques, in quote, that might have been employed by the kids? All right, thank you so much for having me. And um, I must say that at this point that um, research has revealed and evidence has proven that um, children who are remanded um, usually develop mental health problems um, in the multiple of three than children who are not put in such environment. So I, I must say that um, it could be a lot damaging on their psychological and mental states um, ranging from some of the things that they might have gone through and the process of being remanded. And some of those things include um, having to have some cognitive distortions, talking about thinking patterns, their thoughts and their beliefs. Just like what you said, that um, they might not be able to comprehend uh, exactly what is happening to, say, to them. So they're having a lot of questions in their heart. They're having a lot. To them, they felt they were fighting for a just cause. You know, but now it's like, okay, so what's happening? I'm supposed to be safe, but I'm not safe. So there's a lot of insecurity. There's a lot of cognitive distortions. And the damaging effect is not just for now, but also for the future. Mm. It is a deep one which can bring up more psychotic features, talking about the likes of depression, major depressive disorder. Um, a lot of times we have discovered in the long run that sometimes they might develop antisocial personality disorder, which is detrimental to the society itself. So what we are trying to cover at the end of the day ends up being what we are now tend to face from the set of children. <laughs> uh, Mrs. Kintai, I hope it's okay for me to call you Mrs. I, 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 I have a theory, right? And, and bear with me. I can draw a straight line, you know, from the lack of political acti activism that we see in Nigerian adults to what is happening with the children that we're seeing in the courtrooms. And, it, it, and, and my theory is that because, the, 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 because of the heavy handedness that we see with the law and our judiciary and how they like to make example of, of the minority, oftentimes when they come out to speak out, we see when they grow up into adulthood, they wash themselves out and we always make statements like, oh, even if I vote, they're going to pick who they want mm -hmm. to pick, right? And so for children involved in political act activism, at such a young age, and let's put into context what, what the nation is going through at this time, how can being charged and detained at such an age, a young age, affect their development, both in terms of mental health, their sense of security, and when I say security, I mean that thing of, as I said, young adults, or rather adult Nigerians 
always checking out or finding a better way to jack back? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. That's a very brilliant one. Usually, children um, make recourse to what they hear from their parents. I, you know, I'm so I'm sure we are so familiar with it that while we were growing up, you hear parents keep telling you, even when you were small, Nigeria is this, Nigeria is bad, is this, is that, and then we still grow up and the children are hearing the same thing. So most of the time, um, what um, happened in the uh, in being uh, being an activist in that context is from what they heard from their parents. And the truth is, whether we like it or not, they are also at the receiving end of whatever is happening in the society. So at the end of the day, in the long term, we are losing talent and resources. Mm. You know, people that should stand up for the nation in the future. We are losing a bundle of people who are supposed to believe in our nation and give back to the society. So at the end of the day, you will not be surprised if the same set of people, like you said, are the ones who feel that the nation is not protecting me. I'm not safe in the nation, then why not I move to a place that will much more protect me and give me the safety and the serenity of mind? So in a, just like you said, in a long way, it affects their commitment and their loyalty to the national status. Right. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much, Mr. We'll get back to you. I want to come to Suji here, Mr. Suji Kenne. Now, we see all of this happening, and I'm wondering what the impact could be, what the precedence it's setting for youth involvement when it comes to protest or, or matters of governance. Mm. How, what are the consequences of this? How is this going to set the platform for what we see onward? Is this a strategy by the government to actually make the youth population very docile, seeing how in Africa youth activism is becoming a strong thing? So oh, yes. in Kenya, Ghana, Botswana, oh, yes. Oh, yes. maybe it's Nigeria's turn. Maybe we even started it. So what From are the consequences? Uh, All the protests we've had yes. in bad governance or in South. Yeah. What is the consequence of this, this confinement, this stress on this case, especially uh, on the youth population when it comes to governance? Right. So the effects of actions like this um, by the government and by government agencies, mm -hmm. and due to the pressure, the violation of human rights, the Nigerians can take it maybe for too long, you know. But when rights are confined to an extent that people can no longer, you know, um, go about their lives, you know, um, in compliance with what the law says, there's most likely going to be a reaction, you know, and reactions can be in different ways, people taking up um, courses, you know, in law or other affairs, you know, people protesting more because people may see that lives have been lost and then say, I'm not afraid to lose my life for what I believe in. So the actions of governments have ripple effects. You, have, you can cause fear and the fear can turn maybe to something else. Uh, uh, sorry, Julie. Go ahead. You, you're, you're on the cusp of something here. <laughs> we are on the cusp of one very interesting concept here. Mm. Now, my question is the Intent, the, 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 the suggested intent on the government to make this a big deal, we all know the gravity of the, 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 the crime of treason, mm. but is this a kind of use this case to show them, I don't care who's involved, whether minors or not, use this case to show them that we mean business. Could this be a strategy from the government or from the judiciary itself regarding protests or dissent? Yeah, because if you look at uh, the precedents before the protest, the government persuaded Nigerians, they begged the youths, do not go out, do not protest, you know, it may turn violent. And in some areas, it wasn't violent initially, and then it got violent in some states, you know, and the government was intent to um, forestall protest. And they were caught others, granted, 24 hours before the protest to confine the protesters to a location. And then governments made it clear that they would not allow violation of, uh, they would not allow destruction of property. And then I believe that may have been a reaction to the government to show intent, like you mentioned, to show commitment to um, having, maybe suppressing the mm -hmm. rights of Nigerians and then showing intent to punish, yes, to punish Very um, citizens if if you do not be to the will of the government. I must say, Kenna, um, and work with me, just, let's just play this game, shall we? Okay. You ready? I'm ready. <laughs> All right, let's do it. If they are found guilty, what is a crime for treason? What is a, a punishment. punishment for treason? And would it be exerted on these kids? So generally speaking, treason, if found which is punishable by death, attempt to treason, if found guilty, is punishable by life imprisonment. However, the Charge Rights Act 
which guides child, child and everything relating to children when it comes to judicial administration says that a child cannot be sentenced to death. Mm. Can they be sentenced to life in prison? So, the Child Act also says that if a child is found guilty of treason, murder, or any action that causes grievous bodily harm, you know, in the court, in the family court, the judge can make an order to um, can make because the words used are not conviction or sentencing for children. Mm. So the judge can make an order that the child, such a child, can be kept somewhere, you know. Um, mm. And then the place where the child is to be kept is not a general prison, mm -hmm. you know, as long as it deems fit. So the child should be kept in legal custody. That's the word the Child okay. Rights uh, um, Act uses. So the child can be kept in legal custody. The Child Rights Act protects what, from what age to what age, just to, for, for the sake of our viewers? Anybody under the age of 18 years. Anybody mm -hmm. under the age of 18 years. You are the executive director of Ella Africa. When you heard the news of them being held for three months in jail, how was that, how was that reaction for you? Well, unfortunately, I wasn't surprised. Mm. Mm. The very first case we handled as an organization, uh, the Ally Initiative, was a case of a minor. We were interviewing um, uh, inmates at, at, at a prison in Lagos, and then I saw a minor walking. And then I knew that we have to take his case. He was mm. out of place. He shouldn't have been at the prison where he was. He should have been at the juvenile center. You know? So we go to prison regularly and we see them there. So this is not a, the first of, 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 of its type happening in Nigeria. Across prisons, across okay. the Federation, we are emails. So when I saw that, I could relate clearly to what's um, happening. What what is well, happening? what that kid went through. Exactly. Ken, I want to say thank you, but we're going to put a pause on this conversation for just a minute because we're going to be bringing you the news by 9 a.m., so we're asking that you do stay tuned. There's still breakfast extra. There's still so much and so many other subjects that we have to touch on for today's show. We'll be back after this. And you're welcome back. You're watching Breakfast Extra here on News Central TV. We've been talking about the minor hashtag NSAD's governance, or rather NBAD governance uh, protesters who were arraigned in court and collapsed that have now sparked outrage and also criticism and a lot of uh, skepticism about, you know, their collapse or the system. And so we're having an in-depth conversation about this, the legal implication of them being arraigned at such a young age, as well as the psychological effect on the children, uh, as the minors, and also their parents as well. And also joining us to discuss this, uh, our guest uh, from earlier, we have Kene Osuji, who is a legal practitioner and the executive director the Ella Africa. And we also have Motolani Akintayo. She's a clinical psychologist and managing director of senior, senior uh, clinical psychologist, uh, Diamond Moore uh, Psychological Consults. And they both join us with the discussion. Now, uh, Motolani, for, just to wrap up this, I want to come to you for my final question, right? And let's also put the family uh, into view. We've been talking about the minors, but so much so the family. Um, w while speaking to our reporter, we heard him talk about how uh, a mother was saying, one of the parents was saying that um, she sent her child on an errand and he never got back home. Uh, one was standing in front of the, their home and he was, you know, uh, taken along with the rest of the boys. And the next thing she heard was that the child was in custody uh, of the police uh, for treason and crimes, treasonable felony. And so it, it, we have to ask the question about you know, uh, what it means for their family at this time in terms of trauma for them and stigmatization as well. Will they be stigmatized by the community and just how the relations will be for the parents moving forward? That's, that's a very good question, excuse me. And um, I must say that um, that's the bane of my concern at this point in time. It's about how we can undo what exactly is happening with the children and what is happening with the parents. Because I, I must say that um, currently um, there's a lot of trauma um, um, that the parents is going, parents rather, or the family members are going through, as well as the children. And there is absolute need for intervention, family therapy, psychosocial support to help these people overcome the trauma and stigmatization that comes with this. You know, there's that stigma of, oh, your child is part of them, or, oh, you know, so there's a lot of fear and anxiety and excessive worry 
that uh, many of the family members will be experiencing, which can actually exasperate to become more chronic mental health issues, including medical issues like raised BP, stroke, and the rest of them. So it's very pertinent for us at this point in time to, to armor and to um, insist on um, psychosocial support, not just for the children, but for the family in general to help them overcome the trauma and the stigma that comes with this time so that we do not have a lot of victims, you know, coming out from the situation. Uh, Motolani, I also have to ask about mental health provision in the courtroom. After mm. the scenes that happened over the week, seeing that much chaos, so much so that the judge had to walk away, um, one has to ask if the court should start to mandate mental health services readily available at courtrooms for cases like this. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, we have gone past the age where you believe that mental health has to do with just the madman on the street. Definitely not. Every parastatal and organization should begin, inclusive of the court um, uh, um, unit also, should begin to entrench mental health um, involve, involvement in courts and in their cases, particularly training of their staff. You know, I was in Lagos, a part of Lagos last week, training some employees of, of a shipping company on mental health and all that. So it is very pertinent that you, you bring in the expertise of mental health professionals and not just that, but training of the staff so that they can know what to do when such cases happen or even as precautions before they happen. Because a lot of times prevention is actually better than kill. Let me come back into the studio here and have a conversation here with um, Kenne. Kenne, like um, if you were listening from earlier, we started the show by actually noting the many other instances that have involved these kinds of antiques. I keep going back to that word because that's what it is. We saw Olisa Metu, we saw Deziani, we saw um, Dino Milai, who's a very, very big player, and I mean player in terms of actor. I mean that very deliberately, Jim. Yeah, of course. Who else am I missing out? <laughs> um, Olisa Mechu. I have put, already. He was, yeah, he was classic. Uh, he was the one that ate the thing. Abdul Rez, uh, Abdul Rez, uh, Abdul Maina. Maina. Yeah, there was. Oh, he, he started this all, didn't he? Yes, he did. So we've seen these cases from before, and we haven't seen what came of the instance. What, what, uh, uh, how do I put it now? What, uh, <laughs> help me out here. What did the court do in these other cases? In these cases, where and they put, employed antics, antics to, exactly. to wiggle their we way out We didn't see this much judge. drama follow those mm -hmm. antics. So why? What gives? Legally, what recourse can the or should the court have taken in these previous in instances that seem overlabored now? So when it comes to antics, it, is, um, it, is, it depends on who is saying it's an antic. You know, mm. I, uh, the court is trained or the court usually decides what it allows in the court. Mm. And when the health of a person is said to be um, adversely affected by a trial, generally speaking, the court is mandated to post the trial to give recourse to uh, medical attention. And most times when uh, a person is charged with court, we always see that the health is being brought forward. So it's, it's very, um, it's not um, a, a topic that um, it's very has delicate. a straightforward answer. Yeah. Uh, because it involves the health. Mm. So if I'm saying I'm unwell, I should be giving, or except you have an independent medical practitioner to say, oh, this is not mm. well, this is not unwell. But it all depends. I would say I want my own medical practitioner yeah. to attend to my health. So generally speaking, the health of defendants have been used as a factor to um, delay trial or to seek adjournments, and there is no clear way out because it involves the health. And you know, um, the courts haven't stepped in because, like I said, it is um, um, subject to what the person says he feels. The president has directed the uh, the A the AGF, the Attorney General of the Federation, to review the case file. Um, do you see any positive outcome from that? Yes, I, I, I believe I do. Uh, we won't do it to the outrage and then due to the charges, like we said. The intention and the action must marry for there to be a successful charge for treason, for incitement to mutiny, um, for the charges against the, the defendants. Were they capable 
of committing the actions? Did they have the intention? The mere fact that some people carried flags or some, you know, what was the intention of these um, children? You know, so when I believe the Attorney General of the Federation reviews the charges, I believe that he has the power to do so. Uh, I believe that there may be a positive outcome um, from the review. Can they, can they, I'm sorry, Mr. Yes, okay. Can they revoke the bill if they, if they review the, the case file? Can they say, okay, we're revoking the bill, no need for you to pay that, you can walk away scot free? Yes, yeah, so when the Attorney General of the Federation reviews the case, there are a few things that can happen. Uh, one is that the charges against certain people can be withdrawn from the court, which we believe is the most likely outcome of the review. Two, the counsel for the, uh, for the children can actually ask for the bail conditions to be varied. Sometimes when bail conditions are the way uh, they are in, in this case, uh, you know, counsel can ask for the conditions to be varied so that the, the uh, defendants, the chief children, can meet up with the mm. bail conditions. Prosecution came out to say, don't mind um, uh, the, the, what you see here, these are all just displays that were put together or orchestrated. The IG of police also told that these are married men. Don't mind what you're seeing on the media. <laughs> How does that impact you? And I'm going to also extend that to Mutalani, who's uh, online as well. But first you, how does that impact you? Yeah, so I'm being careful because my side is subjudice, but okay. generally who he, who he who asserts must prove. If they say that, um, if the other counsel says a person is married, you should bring marriage certificates to prove um, that they are married. If he says they are graduates, you should stand out um, um, exhibits to show that they have um, um, university degrees. degrees. You know, so counsel, I wouldn't speak again because I'm, I mean, I'm being careful, um, uh, but the facts speak for itself. Mm -hmm. Okay. Motolani, from a psychologist's point of view, how did that impact you when you heard the IGP and also the prosecution tell that these are just, these are not children, these are men? Wow. Sincerely, um, because we, we were not there in person, you know, we would not want to, um, we want to be careful and not totally say it is not as it is or as it is said. But um, we would want to just uh, look at the, 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 the modality and pictures that we have there, you know, and see things from the perspective of people who actually witnessed it. And just like the law said, um, let um, um, different um, evidences to prove that be brought out, you know, so that people can actually know what exactly the true picture is. But be it as it may, my concern is not even so much about whether um, they are full-grown men or not, but the picture that I see sees, um, shows to me that there is need for intervention for the people that I have seen. For, for me, it's not a question of whether, yes, if they are married, if they are okay, let's stop all those uh, trying to detect what it is but let's look at those pictures and then intervene critically because for me the question is what happens to the people that i am seeing after now they are lives i am concerned about their well-being after now oh. thank you very much Matalani. kene was actually nodding in the here entire time this Where is a very interesting Motolani, I must say thank you so much for doing this with us. Motolani Akintayo, she is a clinical psychologist, joined us here to look at the psychological impact of uh, the arraignment and detention of the minors. Also joining us uh, here was also Kenne Osuji. He's a legal practitioner and the executive director of the Ella Africa. Now, if you know anyone who is illegally detained, you might want to reach out to them. They are the Ella, Ella uh, Africa, just um, umbrella, Ella, <laughs> A, A. I'm sorry, I'm doing that. Oh, it's a lot. It's okay. <laughs>